So welcome, hello again, to this series of interviews with people exploring more about the fact that we are built for this, given the challenges that we're going through right now. My name is Wynne Morgan, and with me is Shalia Stevens, as always. And today, welcome a dear friend of both of us, um, John L. Mokadem, who's going to share, um, in, in my mind, some of the most powerful things that I've heard about this understanding, about how we really work as human beings, and how amazing that can be given the way that we are living right now mm. so john a bit about you to begin with please gosh uh well yeah as you said my name's john el mokadem i'm pleased to be with you guys two of my friends i've known for quite a while now uh i w work as a coach here in the uk um a lot of my clients are people who have chronic health issues, um and uh that's something that i've fallen into I would say not as a plan, but by accident, as a result of you know having gone through a healing journey myself, um, and then getting uh, stumbling, I would say, into some insight around how our um, state of mind and our understanding of how we work as human beings actually has a potential to have a profound effect on um, not only our health, but also our mental well-being when we are unwell. Um, and so I spend a lot of time pointing people to that um, and helping them understand it, you know, when they're going through chronic health conditions as well. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit about me. I can go on longer, but you probably don't want to hear any more. <laughs> well, uh, I, I could have actually just said, tell us more about that. So here's the question we'd love, <laughs> we'd love to ask you today, which is, what have you seen that makes us as human beings built for this, given the work that you're doing? Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, there was so much that I didn't understand about how we as human beings were i went through my sort of health situation so i was ill between 2007 and 2014 um with a condition known as chronic syndrome and i had all kinds of you know scary symptoms at, at my worst i spent three months in hospital um you know trying to get back to a level of function and, and i'd gone from being someone that was I viewed myself as a real go-getter, make results happen, striving, pushing, struggling. I was that kind of person. And so when I got ill and I found myself in this really debilitated state, I really suffered um, because I was so busy trying to get myself back to how I was. And there was a, an interesting thing that happened to me in the very early stages of that illness, um, which was, it, it, it seemed almost benign at the time, but I was, I was with a friend of mine who was a, a, a yoga teacher. And I remember just having a, an innocent conversation with him. I can't remember specifically what it was about, but I was sort of surveying the smoldering wreckage that was my life at that point, you know, uh, still very debilitated and my life kind of in a mess. And whilst I was talking with this friend of mine, I, I found myself in this sense of well-being this knowingness that I was okay, this quiet place. And it knocked me for six because it didn't make sense. You know, I was sitting there with having viewed a model of the world, which was when I make this happen and when I've struggled to control all the scenarios in my life, I'll be okay. And yet here I was in this situation experiencing this level of quiet and well-being when everything in my life was up in the air. So it, it completely upset the paradigm that I'd lived by. Now, I didn't spend very long in this feeling of well-being, but I, I got very curious what was behind it. And I then spent the next seven years trying to understand, well, hey, what happened that day when I spent 10 seconds? Because it can't have been any more than that. You know, what, what happened that day when I spent 10 seconds in this place of well-being and yet my life was a, you know, total mess. Um, and that was what took me on this journey of, of understanding, you know, how the mind works and, 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 and what's really living us, um, for want of a better term. And, and I came to see a number of things that, one, the thing that happened that day 
was that for a brief moment, I dropped out of thought. I dropped out of my noisy thinking about my life, my circumstances, my illness, my marriage, all these things which were seemingly in a mess. For a brief moment, I dropped out of that. And, and that was a useful thing for me to see, to begin to see that I had been looking for peace in fixing stuff. And actually, every single one of us is walking around with peace inside of us right now. And it's simply underneath the noise of our thinking. It is not in the correction of our circumstances. Now that's really helpful right now for every single one of us to know. Because if you are in a hospital and you've got this bug, or if you are worrying about somebody that is sick, or you're worrying about your business or your kids or how the world is going to be, and it looks like that's a big burden and how am I going to manage it? What am I going to do about it? Well, to begin to see that the peace is not on the other end of navigating all of that uncertainty. The peace is what's sitting right there underneath your attempts to figure it out, yeah. right? That's good to know because now you're starting to find what you're looking for and you don't have to control what is essentially uncontrollable. You don't get to change all of those things that are going on. None of us can do anything specifically about what's happening in, in the world with all of these things. And it's really good to know we don't need to in order to experience that quiet. So that was the first thing. The second thing was part of the reason why I didn't spend any longer than 10 seconds in that space of quiet, and it took me seven years to actually figure out what was going on and why I didn't live there very often, was I, like many of us, was subjected to a, a misunderstanding about what lives life, right? Now, I genuinely thought that I made life happen. And I thought I made life happen by how much I was living in my head, war gaming, figuring out, working out, managing, controlling. I thought that was what made life happen. And that was partly why I was sick. Because the more I lived in that place of trying to figure out my health, well, ironically, I was undermining my health. I was causing my nervous system to live in a place of fight or flight. And fight or flight is not where healing occurs. It's not where our immune system works optimally. It's not where neurotransmitters are made or hormones are organized. That's where tigers are run away from. Well, I lived in that. And I, I wore it almost as a badge of honor because I thought, well, if I live in that more and more and more, that's what makes life happen. So imagine my surprise when seven years later, I realized that the thing that I thought was keeping me safe and navigating my life, being in my thinking, was actually the thing that had been stimulating my body to be in this broken down, worn out state. And the more I began to look at that and go, well, okay, if, if, if I'm not really running it in my head, well, what is? And that's when I started to see, oh, well, wait a minute. If it's really true that I run my body in my thinking, none of us should be alive because we are not thinking on a 24 hour basis about the hundreds, probably thousands of processes, chemical reactions, and things that are going on right now in our body. We don't think about them, yeah. but they're working. Why are they working? Because there's something deeper before thought that makes that happen, right? It is not up to us. So all the attempts I was doing to manage my energy they were not making me manage my energy well, they were using my energy, right? Now, the more I started to see, well, wait, that intelligence is there and it's before thought. Well, where else does that work, right? And that's when I started to get curious. So my healing journey came about as a result of really seeing two things. One, that space of well-being is ever present. 
underneath the noise of our thinking. And two, I don't need to think about my body processes because something else does that, right? So good to know. That's now off my list. I'm fired from dealing with. <laughs> but where else did I not see it? Well, I started to see, well, okay, is it true then that my knowingness of what to do in uncertainty comes from the degree of thinking that I put in? Is my knowingness about, um, you know, what decision to make? coming from my thinking or is it coming from somewhere else is my ability to create new stuff coming from the uh, you know the constant machinations of my mind or maybe that comes from someone else too so i started to get curious about all these areas where i lived in my head thinking that that, that was what and that en enabled me to navigate life and going well i wonder if they work just the same as the thing that manages my body. I wonder if those things aren't my job either, mm -hmm. right? Now, that was what I started to see. I started to just get curious about it and to see, well, actually, there are lots of times when I move to do things and I don't think about them. I'm suddenly moved to send an email. I am moved to go to the bathroom without thinking about it. I am suddenly out for a walk and I find an idea pops in my head and I suddenly know what to do with the business challenge. And it is not happening because of my thinking. It's happening despite it, right? Good to know when our worlds have been turned upside down and our lovely shiny plans for how we're going to live our lives and what we're going to do have suddenly been turned, you know, 180 degree. Well, we're now sitting there going, well, now what I do, what do I do? Well, fortunately, that's not our job. Not up here, it's not. Mm. Fortunately, the same thing that runs our bodies is going to move our bones is going to show us ideas, is going to let us know what needs to be done. Now, the bit that we don't like about that, in my experience, is human beings like to have plans. They like to know what they're gonna do. And unfortunately, that intelligence behind life does not tell us what to do um, in a nice, shiny, mapped out way. It doesn't say, send this email, because in sending this email, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. And in X, Y, and Z happening, you'll now get a nice shiny business that's going to bring in X amount of money and income, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't do that. It doesn't work that way. It simply is do, do this, do that, do this, <laughs> do that. And it's in the moment and it's devoid of, of any sense of where something is leading. Our minds really don't like that at all. Mm. But the more we can recognize that we are riding around in that peace that we're looking for before thought, the more we can see actually, oh, there is an intelligence to this. Like, you know, the, that intelligence seems to know how to navigate my body. You know, it seems to be able to help get me across the road when I'm not thinking about it in advance. Well, the more we get curious about that, the more you start to see, oh, there is an unfolding intelligence here, but this will never understand it. Our minds will never get that because what this does is it boxes things in, right? It likes to box in things and go, yes, I understand this now, but it doesn't really understand the full picture. It's trying to understand something that is infinite in nature. It's always going to come up with crap conclusions. <laughs> you can't trust it. It doesn't know what it's doing, right? It's like a little kid and it's going, I know what's happening. It's like, no, you really don't. I know you really think you do, but you don't really. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems like bad news to begin with, but it, but it really isn't because after a while you start to see, well, not only is it safe for us to dwell in quiet, but actually that intelligence is connected to everything else. So it sort of knows more than our mind. So we don't need to be so bothered about the conclusions this is making up. And we'll still be moved to do what needs to be done to look after ourselves. Now that's for me what makes us built for this. Not only are we always okay, 
because okay is a state of being it's not a state of doing but there's something else carrying us through life and it's just really from what i can see if i was to describe what's happened it's like mother nature has just shown us in no, no uncertain terms that really we always live in the unknown yeah it's just that we think a lot of the time we've got enough saving illusions that appease our mind most of the time that make us go oh yeah i'm sort of in control and i sort of am i sort of know what's going on well mother nature's gone you know what i'm going to do i'm going to give you a good lesson in how things really are and i'm going to turn everything off just like that and you're going to get to see how little you really do know what's going on but how much if you're willing to look that might not be the problem that you think it is. And the more we get to look at that, the more hope I have, right? Because people can really see right now, I did a talk last night about how this is mother nature's virtual intensive for the world. <laughs> right? It's like, it's restricted our doing. So we can't do half the things we would normally do to deal with our experience and to try and cope with it. But if we're willing to get curious about that and see, well, maybe we don't need to do half of those things to be okay. Mm. Maybe we're actually okay anyway. Well, what kind of world might we go back into when the doors are unlocked? How much better might we function for the realization that we don't need to do the 10 million things that we were doing to try and be okay? Because Mother Nature's just kindly woken us up to the fact yeah. that we are okay by shutting us down <laughs> like how cool could that be <laughs> um so yeah i guess that's part of what i'm seeing <laughs> <laughs> lovely um i don't know if that's 20 minutes or not but <laughs> <laughs> you think we're timing you down to the second yeah, you're good you're good <laughs> i don't know if there's more you want to ask me i don't know that's kind of my open a start of a 10 if you like um. well one thing that came up for me is and, I, and i've heard you talk about this when when we've been working together at weekend retreats and yeah and you've talked a lot about the pursuit of control and the fact that it looks like especially when things are uncertain mm. when we notice the fact that things are uncertain mm. we then try and control more and that that then um, puts us into more anguish as opposed to less. And yeah. while you mentioned that in today, yeah. is there anything else you've seen, any other stories of uh, your clients or for you where the, people have woken up to the illusion of control being a good idea? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's funny. Like, I can think of my own journey with this. If you think of about what the illusory engine of control is it's our thinking right mm -hmm. and the more uncertain things get the more likely we are if we don't understand how our experience is made and how things work the more likely we are to go up into our head into that engine and what i found is that the more I have recognized that the peace is before that, that thinking, the less likely I am to go into that engine of control. Because it's like, well, I don't need to. And people think that's a bad thing. They think, well, surely, I remember someone, actually a retreat we did when, I don't know if you remember this, but somebody said, I feel like I've been clinging on to the side of a mountain, holding on for dear life, and I've realized there's nowhere to fall right now. That clinging on is the clinging on to the thinking and the control. And yes, I can make all this stuff happen and thinking, well, if I do that enough, I'll be okay. But then to recognize that when you let go of that and you really see you aren't in control, it isn't bad news at all because you fall into, you don't fall into the abyss. You fall into what you're looking for you fall into peace, pieces before all of that thinking. Now that does so much for people, I think, 
to begin to get curious about where peace is. Because if I was to characterize what most people and what I've done to try and find peace, it's like this. It's like, hey, I'm going to go to a rock concert and I'm going to find the quietest seat in the rock concert. That's what we do to try and find peace. We go into our thinking to try and find peace. <laughs> and you don't ever find it there because the nature of what's up there is noisy. Same as a rock concert. You don't go to a rock concert to look for the quietest seat. You just don't go there in the first place. Yeah. Right? That's what I keep seeing. This is not the route to peace. This will keep you busier than ever because that's its nature. Right? Now, as you start to see that the peace is before all of that, but that that doesn't surrender your ability to perform. Like lots of the people that get sick that I work with, with they are in that type a category right they are high performers as strivers achievers pushers and they get terrified as i did that being quiet now suddenly makes you passive underperforming you know lay about not going to achieve results etc etc because they really have gotten caught in this idea that you've got to live in that to perform. No, you don't. It was an illusion in the first place that this was connected to what happened. Right. So once you get someone to even get sight of that, it's like, okay, so I can still be a performer, but I don't have to make myself sick in the process. It's like, yeah, that's on the cards. This was just like an engine that was never in gear that you were keeping your foot on the pedal and revving to 8,000 revs every day, thinking that that's what made the car go, but it's never been in gear, right? So all you did was wear out the engine. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you right. know, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, John. Not at all, pleasure. Always Ooh. a treat to listen to you and... Uh, <laughs> and people can look at the information below this video to find out more about you and also for all of you to know that there's a lot more of these um these videos there that help us see more about the fact as john has done with us today about the fact that we are built for this yeah so thanks very much and see you all soon Not thanks so much. thank you